Hi, good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Now we are starting our first session on satellites in mobility. I request our chairperson and moderator, Dr. V. S. Hegde, former scientific secretary to ISRO and CMD Entrex, to join the dice. Please, sir. Good morning and uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, we have lost a little time because the inaugural session this morning extended. So now without uh, wasting any further time, let me have the honor of inviting the keynote speaker as well as the other panelists. Research Director NSR, kindly join us. We keep seeing NSR reports on the kind of revenues the mobility market is generating. Mr. Harsh Verma, Vice President, Sales Asia, SAS Global. And Mr. Rajendra Bhuvan Urmalia, Product Head, FMC Business, Nelco. Welcome and please join us. Not there. So, uh, I don't want to say much because mobility market is a niche market. You know, long time ago when there were few satellites operating, we were talking about ESIM, Earth Stations in Motion. You know, the antennas which could be turned, which could be directed, then slowly antennas on board, aircrafts, ships, trying to track satellites and make the best use of them. But as the number of satellites grew and grew, the GEO, MEO, LEO, and that too in constellations, basically forming mesh at different altitudes around the Earth, and all targeting, majority, majority of, uh, you know, the target applications being in the mobility sector. I mean, I, I don't have to really emphasize the importance of satellites in mobility. It is very well understood. And to me, as a non-techie by training, it looks like, uh, you know, building the satellite to realizing the constellation in time because you know you launch a certain number of satellites today and certain number of satellites with a gap the whole purpose of seeing the constellation in full bloom is lost so realizing satellites in their intended position deriving service out of them and you know handling those many satellites together is practically the mission management or whatever intricacies are involved up to generating service and delivering it to meet the mobility needs. I think everything is pretty important. Uh, so uh, though we all know that the revenue comes out of downstream applications of terrestrial mobility, aviation, uh, maritime mobility and things like that, but realizing the constellations there, operating them itself is a challenge and 4,000 plus satellites revolving, you know, working, revolving right now. And yesterday, one of our colleagues mentioned that there is a filing for 243,000 satellites in ITU in the next 10 years or so. So, I mean, almost all 
of course very soon there will be need to access you know communication to moon and mars as well i mean when we are talking habitation so i don't have to emphasize the importance of the topic so what i thought is without taking time i will request our keynote speaker uh, dr sheryl smile to speak for about 8 to 10 minutes following that i will request the four distinguished panelists to talk i don't want to poke questions in between and try to drive anywhere because they are well aware what to convey to the audience you know as relevant to the topic and at the end we will take probably four to five questions from the audience uh, and uh, with that about 55 minutes or so we will try to close the session if you all agree so may i request dr sherly smile to give his talk about 8 to 10 minutes or Good morning. It's an uh, honor and a privilege to be here. Uh, in the spirit of Diwali, I hope I can shed some light and bring some knowledge. Uh, and I know my colleagues on this panel will do the same. Um, I would like to start with uh, a brief mention of the past, a little bit about the present, and mostly um, about the future as we see it at Intelsat. Uh, Intelsat, uh, just looking at the past, has been involved in a series of firsts in the satellite industry. In 1965, uh, we launched the uh, first satellite, commercial satellite. 1969, uh, transmitted uh, uh, signals from the moon globally. 1970s, the first sa communications satellite network. Uh, in the year 2000. Uh, a billion uh, people watched the uh, Sydney Olympics globally. Um, jumping forward a little bit, 2016, we launched a network of uh, high throughput uh, satellites. And then in uh, 2020, uh, it's not on this slide, but we launched uh, uh, what we call an, uh, a mission extension vehicle, which is kind of like a gas station in space uh, that refueled the satellite and extended its life. um so a series of innovations uh is part of our dna as as a company uh at present we have a large uh, terrestrial and satellite integrated network 52 satellites uh 62 telescopes and i believe something like 1500 uh terabytes daily Fifteen hundred terabytes daily of carrier grade um, capacity, uh, which I think uh, I'm not a techie myself either, but I think that's quite a lot. Um, looking to the future, what we'd like to do is I, uh, we're at a several people have mentioned that uh, India is at a critical point uh, in terms of recognizing the value of the satellite space sector. I believe that it is also true as the title of our present of our event suggests we're dealing with the next generation and what I'd like to highlight is from our perspective what we see as five key uh, elements of the next generation of satellites uh the first is that they will be software defined satellites um uh, we've already procured a four software geo satellites that are enormously flexible and can uh, focus bandwidth and power over any location within its coverage within minutes if not seconds second 
uh, and there was the debate yesterday. Uh, uh, somebody mentioned that uh, there is a multi-orbit faction and a, a Leo uh, faction. Uh, we definitely come on the side of the multi-orbit. Uh, we see the need for partnering with Leos. We already do partner with OneWeb. We are working on a, a MEO system, uh, a HAPS, a high altitude platform system, and of course our terrestrial network. And this will enable us to mix and match uh, the space-based networks in different orbits as well as the terrestrial network to create the best of breed solutions that adapt to the specific needs of our customers. Uh, third is uh, a software-defined network and virtualization of the network. So services can be managed, they can be automated uh, and orchestrated end-to-end -end with software. Uh, fourth is uh, the 5G integration. Um, Mike Short yesterday talked about how uh, satellites and the mobile sector are not uh, at odds with each other but working in concert and that is very true if you look at standards um, where the satellite is being integrated into the uh, 5G architecture. It used to be uh, that 3G uh, was initially for mobile phones but with the demand for connection ev anywhere at any time satellites are a key element and if you look at versions 17 and 18, uh, they integrate uh, uh, satellite connectivity. Um, the fifth point is very significant, and that's the smart edge terminals. Uh, essentially, what you're seeing is that there'll be a range of new terminals that will leverage innovations uh, in flat panel uh, antennas, software-defined satellite access, uh, they will support 5G as cloud-based services and apps. Um, with SDN and all the virtual components to replace hardware, there will be a tremendous new value for consumers at the edge uh, in the form of capabilities like uh, SD-WAN, content delivery, and gateways for local networks. Uh, think about it as, um, I, I don't know if anybody remembers flip-top phones but nobody uses them anymore. And now with our smartphones, you have a whole new range of capabilities uh, and applications. So uh, just take a minute to talk about what the next generation um, satellites mean. Um, it, it, it first means um, with a software-defined satellite, you have additional bandwidth. Um, our next generation satellites typically, typically deliver 4x in bandwidth uh, compared with the uh, previous generation of high throughput satellites. Uh, we have already acquired four of them. They will be operational beginning in 2025 and we have plans to expand uh, to uh, an additional, uh, I believe, six uh, over the next several years. Uh, these, these, with a software-defined satellite, you have the ability to create new beams, to change the shape of the beam, to change the allocation of power within a beam, uh, allocate capacity, change frequencies, and all of this can be done after the satellite has been launched, which is something that has not been possible until now. Um, before, because they are software-defined uh, SDS satellites, they will play a more active role in seamlessly integrating space with the ground network uh, and offering end-to-end -end solutions, staying in constant contact with the hub, the Earth-based hub, smart edges, the terminals we talked about, and wide area networks to um, meet the connectivity needs of uh, our customers. Service management uh, is going to be very easy because customers from the edge will be able to uh, choose uh, what their needs are, dynamically uh, allocating it um, and making it much more cost effective. 
Um, I should spend a few minutes on the uh, multi-orbit strategy. Um, and and the, the reason why we are firmly in this camp is that different satellites have different strengths um, and weaknesses. Um, no si two systems are the same. Because of the difference in altitude, LEO systems have an advantage in terms of latency, the top bar there. They are the green areas. Uh, while geo satellites have the benefit of wider coverage and MEO falls it somewhere in between. LEO systems, because of the size of the constellation, have more aggregate bandwidth, but it's, which is evenly distributed. But uh, geo satellites have more flexibility to focus the bandwidth over specific target areas so that they're better able to support um, surges in demand um, at, at particular locations. LEO systems, because of the narrow coverage, uh, there's a need for a large number of gateways and terrestrial backhaul. This can make the overall network more complex and vulnerable to security challenges. Overall, GEO and MEO, we believe, have better economics uh, over the long run and uh, um, offer more, uh, a, a mix of capabilities. So you really need a multi-orbit strategy uh, as we see it. Uh, now let me uh, turn to a few specific use cases. Uh, uh, you know, it's fine to have this network, but how, what does it really mean in terms of um, uh, actual um, users and uh, our customers? So let's start with um, network operators. We see tremendous um, benefits to uh, uh, this network, our 5G enabled net, uh, next gen network offers new opportunities to dynamically extend the network when and where it is needed. MNO subscribers will be able to use their phones um, when traveling on, on planes, on ships, and enjoy broadband services where using their existing uh, MNO subscription plans. MNOs will be able to increase backhaul networks more flexibly and dynamically and offer private LTE and 5G and value-added solutions at the remote edge. A um, very significant point is that they will be able to respond to natural disasters better by dynamically provisioning large amounts of bandwidth at short notice, which is obviously where you need it in terms of um, a disaster uh, or emergency preparedness. And end users will be able to benefit fr from the ability to use satellite delivered media content uh, through applications on their phones. Uh, as as uh, Shivaji mentioned yesterday, we are fortunate to be in this business because we serve people. We provide a valuable service to the community, uh, but we're also in it to make money. And uh, the, uh, the, the size of the pie increases uh, from when you offer wholesale bandwidth, uh, the, the, the smaller pie on the left, then you provide end-to-end -end connectivity, and then finally when you get to offering solutions. So it's a significant um, uh, increase in the pie. And this is also true particularly of the mobility. Um, I think. In one slide, but if you look at mobility, you have a similar kind of growth with the um, uh, the three areas of uh, land mobile, maritime, and aero. And aero has the most significant uh, potential for growth we see. Um, uh, we we are already partnering with uh, Nelco. Uh, we have uh, helped to build a teleport at uh, Dehradun, and uh, partnering with. Planet Park at NOIDA. Uh, we helped to, uh, we invested in the teleports. We have a significant commitment in India. Gaurav Karod is uh, my colleague who's been here, well known to everybody in this room, I'm sure. Uh, we have a long standing relationship we, with uh, ISRO, and uh, we are fully committed to uh, um, working with Indian partners uh, in, in, in the very exciting. India decade that, that uh, is, is coming. Um, I will leave it at that um, and uh, 
join the rest of the panel as we, uh, as we continue this discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you for uh, sharing your smile. In fact, we will stay here for the FCC as well. So now I'll uh, request Dr. Laura Roberti. I think Um, so the, I would like to, this session is about mobility and what I would like to do in these uh, few minutes uh, is uh, to mention on one side some regulatory aspects and then just a broad overview of uh, mobility applications via satellite. From a regulatory standpoint, uh, I will be referring only to KA band, which is the band that is of interest to, to Telesat. In this frequency band, there, is a, there has been a lot ongoing in the regulatory, uh, various regulatory forums, including the ITU, to introduce mobility aspects in, in the band. And um, in Europe, it all started um, 20, 2013, followed by a first resolution at WRC 15, in which mobility, and by mobility, I refer to satellite user terminals installed on aircraft, vessels, and vehicles being allowed to operate in KA band with geostationary satellites back in 2015. And then this was followed by a new resolution at the World Radio Communication Conference in 2019, in which the possibility of uh, mobility via satellite was extended to a broader portion of the KA band. And the work is continuing towards WRC 23, where there is a new agenda item to open transmission in KA band, also for user terminals operating with non geostationary satellites. So overall, is more than 10 years of studies and work that are leading to an harmonized global regulatory framework that allows mobility operation with satellites in a safe manner. And by safe manner, I refer to the, the um, absence, uh, protection of other services from possible interference. Uh, of course, uh, this international framework needs to be adopted, adapted uh, at the domestic level, and this means uh, two things. Uh, one is inclusion in the domestic frequency allocation plan, and two uh, is uh, the definition of licensing uh, framework at domestic level. And in relation to, to India, I understand the new frequency allocation plan is being published, and there are again um, progress, uh, um, implementation of the international framework at domestic level. And then uh, uh, back in 2018, if I remember correctly, uh, there was the adoption of the so-called in-flight maritime connectivity policy that at least in my view is a brilliant piece of legislation. And the reason I'm saying this is not because I necessarily agree with all that is detailed in the policy, but is a very streamlined, very clear, very simple, straightforward uh, legislation. And in general, also after having seen uh, the draft uh, uh, new space policy and also the draft telecommunication bill, um, this uh, seems to be the new uh, way forward in terms of drafting legislation in this country, which is, at least in my view is a very, very again, very clear, very streamlined and, and therefore very positive. Um, so this is again a brief introduction on the general uh, policy framework. When it comes to the um, different types of applications, uh, um, there are mainly, we can first of all su subdivide mobility in two different uh, uh, fields. Uh, one is for connectivity to the, to the user, that can be the passenger on an aircraft uh, or a vessel, and the other application is for safety, security, and operational uh, uh, needs. Uh, this latter application, I think, it speaks for itself in terms of its importance, uh, also for life-saving application in the case of emergencies and so on. 
but also when referring to the application for connectivity, um, the purpose is not only for entertainment, because I think all of us uh, can live a few hours on a plane even if we don't stream a movie. But there are other implications, like for instance, the productivity also for the company or for individual, if you're actually allowed to connect to the internet, if we need to work on a long, uh, on a long haul uh, flight. Uh, and then there are also implications for the airlines, uh, because for instance, at least I'm personally convinced that uh, the in-flight entertainment uh, equipment uh, that we have now on most, uh, uh, at least on a number of airlines, uh, it's heavy. It's, uh, it costs to the airlines in terms of fuel consumption, in terms of uh, having to buy and maintain the equipment. And I'm personally convinced that this equipment will ultimately be replaced uh, by in-flight connectivity with our own uh, personal uh, devices. Um, connectivity is even more important, of course, but this also goes without saying. Uh, for seafarers that are stuck at, seas, at sea for, uh, for weeks uh, on end. And all this uh, to, to say that um, satellites are really uniquely placed to provide uh, connectivity. Uh, because uh, as much as terrestrial networks uh, are, are and will expand, uh, they will never cover uh, the oceans, uh, of course. Uh, in this respect, uh, at least we believe that the non-geostationary constellation have an additional uh, uh, something to bring to the table that is also quite unique. Uh, for, if not anything else, uh, in terms of a truly global coverage uh, on the possibility of uh, focusing capacity on the hotspots that can be air airport or ports and, um, and so on. Um, so overall, um, I would stop here for the time being, but uh, again, I think the general message is uh, mobility via satellite is coming more and more, both in terms of applications and uh, regulatory developments. And once again, this really is a field where satellites are irreplaceable. And um, just to conclude, even for um, in-flight connectivity, even air to ground uh, cannot uh, fill this space because again, uh, aircraft also will fly, fly above water where air to ground is not sufficient as a solution. And I would stop here. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you for being so brief. to also have the benefit of aviation connectivity. I hope that is true. And towards the end, I will request our program director, South Prime Minister of Sheikh Ayata, to say, you know, briefly tell us on uh, uh, the status of various legislations or policies for mobility applications in India. Uh, and uh, yes, we also read recently that, uh, you know, Elon Musk is now having a plan to target the private jets. But Costs hell of a lot for, you know, furbishing the planes with uh, the Starlink equipments. Uh, now uh, I will request Mr. Shivaji Chatterjee, and compliments to Hughes because uh, you know uh, the first time I heard about their Jupiter uh, possibilities in India, it was 15 years ago when you know Mr. Pranav Roche had made a presentation to the then ISRO chairman. I happened to be there by accident, and at last. Uh, they are utilizing, you know, courtesy ISRO, courtesy Hughes, they have joined together to utilize the high throughput capacity which was up in Indian skies on board our own satellites and they are taking it across Pan India for rural connectivity. Uh, I think uh, I'll request now uh, Mr. Shivaji Chatterjee to make his remarks. Thank you, sir, and uh, hello to everyone. Definitely, um, you know, uh, with price points of two to three thousand dollars per megahertz, the Indian VSAT industry still reached three hundred thousand VSAT. So, when any opportunity for HTS, whether we did it on our own or by using capacities from ISRO, or uh, you know you have IntelSat, which has an epic uh, uh, constellation, or SES on the panel with SES-12 or O3B, which all have capacities over India. Definitely, it changes the economics. Uh, we definitely, uh, you know, see 
uh, competition more from terrestrial and wireless technologies, which are increasing in reach within the land. And hence, uh, you know, mobility is very relevant because it is one of those, uh, uh, whether it's in the air or in the water, those are areas which are still exclusively satellite domain. And there it's more, it's less about competing with terrestrial or wireless technologies, but more about innovating to meet the user requirement and expectation. Till this, uh, the flight and maritime rules came up in 2019, which Laura mentioned. Uh, it was only the domain of uh, strategic or government users. Uh, we did a network and we are still running for Indian Navy, which uh, connected uh, you know, all the submarines, battleships, uh, aeroplanes, uh, you know, of the Indian Navy, uh, it's a uh, ISRO satellite, GSAT-7, right from South African coast to the Australian coast, all across the Indian Ocean uh, for data, voice, and video. So that gave us our first experience. But only when this uh, opened up uh, three and a half years back, we got a taste of being able to provide mobility service, and it was easier said than done. Uh, honestly, there was a lot of talk that there are 800 to 1,000 commercial Indian flagships and merchant vessels, and they would all take to it and adopt, but it's, it's not like that. There's a big resistance to set up connectivity, to you know, uh, uh, invest in uh, you know, the, anything mobile. The terminals become much more expensive. They're not like a VSAT, which costs a few hundred dollars. They definitely cost a few thousand dollars and sometimes over ten thousand dollars. So with those kind of costs, you, you know the market uh, and the adaptability is uh, uh, done in a very limited manner. But what has really taken up and the experience of three years, mainly I'll say by Nelco and us, which are the two uh, service providers providing direct service in these areas is the maritime area, mainly in the oil and gas energy segment. There is a tremendous activity, not just the rigs and platforms, which are run by ONGC or the private exploration companies. There's a whole ecosystem uh, servicing them, which are called offshore supply or support vessels. Uh, there are many vessels now that the pandemic is over. I'll say this year the activities gone two or three X from the previous two years. And uh, you know you have a lot of vessels coming in for doing specific areas of exploration, cable laying, uh, projects, drilling. And uh, you know it's, uh, it's, a, it's a good time to at least be in this segment. The requirements are very uh, odd. It comes like sometimes they need it for a month or five months. Very short term projects. Uh, sometimes the bandwidths are in few hundred kbps, sometimes it's tens of mbps. So that kind of variability is also not easy to serve, but we've kind of done that. We've adopted, uh, adapted to that uh, uh, need, and we are uh, providing that service. The government has definitely made it much easier to get clearances of WPC because uh, you know there are checks done for any vessel on the move that it has the license uh, to be able to provide uh, the have a connectivity on board. So we've done that. And I'll say this is one segment which is doing well. Um, Cheryl uh, uh, mentioned about uh, you know the uh, association to bring the Intelsat Flex services, which again, it services its global ecosystems of vessels, which come into India very similarly. But they come under a global roaming framework. And uh, that's also uh, you know a market opportunity where at least Indian providers are the ones with the license. <coughs> um, I think the Indian flag vessels will start adopting it, and I think it's still a two, three year cycle before you know gradually uh, the amount of commercial activity increases and it becomes mandatory. The other segment is of course aero, and uh, you know we've uh, seen that many of the global uh, aero service providers have contracts with the global airlines that whenever any country opens up, it mandatorily has to provide service coverage. Uh, Intelsat, Gogo is one example, Panasonic, uh, Anuvu, 
Uh, there are multiple providers which are there uh, who uh, service a lot of the foreign airlines coming into India. So they've taken capacity from Indian providers, but I'll say that that's an area where the value add is not much. We just kind of take bulk capacity and uh, give it to these providers to service their global roaming platforms. There's still no Wi-Fi on board for internet on any Indian domestic flight as yet. And uh, that's a very tough business case. It costs about uh, three to four crores rupees to equip a plane with a Wi-Fi internet system, and uh, there's a downtime also involved. And uh, the planes and the aero industry we know got probably one of the most impacted in the pandemic, and they're just coming back. And now uh, we all know how flights are. They're probably making up for lost time and more. And I really feel that uh, soon it will be inevitable that uh, you know their business cases as the economics change. I think the Leo uh, players are going to play a big role in both maritime and uh, aero because their terminals are already geared to mobility because the satellites are moving. So those are going to be much more cost effective solutions than the current solutions which service aero and maritime in terms of the capex on the equipment. And it will also make the global contracts very easy because they have global constellations. So it's going to be a very interesting time as the Spacecom policy comes, as the NGSO systems get allowed in India. Maybe Mr. Rayapa, as is invited, will uh, give us some light on that. But I feel it's a matter of uh, a year or so when we'll start seeing the NGSO systems in the country, Mio, Leo, and uh, we'll be able to see mobility have a more natural fit and a bigger uptake in that. The last part I'll say is land mobility. It again wasn't allowed in India. And just uh, earlier this year, a few months back, the uh, low bit rate uh, or narrow band uh, rules uh, came into play. And in that, land mobility got allowed. So now as a visa service provider, we can provide land mobility. And for those who heard the minister's uh, uh, you know, announcement on SATCOM reforms yesterday. He said that the SACFA and the land mobility, all that has been abolished and has made it very easy to uh, run these systems. And that's really good. You know, we, to, earlier we used to only provide service to people like uh, <clears throat> the disaster management, emergency response. But now I think you'll see a lot more user cases, especially in the low bit rate. Uh, whether it's L-band, S-band, even now KU-band uh, uh, solutions have come where you have small dishes which the link budget is able to close. And I think that's going to be the biggest area of growth, these kind of solutions for utilities, for fisheries, for uh, fishing vessels, uh, for fleet management, for mining. I think uh, globally all these, uh, the good part about mobility is it's been done everywhere around the world. India was a closed system. I think we just need to look everywhere else and try and bring those business cases and it's how good we make the business case market it. I think that will get us the success. So this is what I have to say on the three segments and how they're doing in India practically on the ground. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shiva Chatterjee, for that wonderful remark. And, uh, you know, yesterday I was discussing with a few of our colleagues, especially the terrestrial mobile communication users. You know, they really want uh, connectivity, but uh, it's, it has to be technology neutral as far as they are concerned, because they don't bother whether it comes from space or terrestrial, whatever. I mean, there should be connectivity all through the journey or all through the travel, that kind of thing. Uh, so, uh, I will now request Mr. Jose uh, Del Rosario, Mr. Jaffer, to kindly highlight because uh, I mean a bit on uh, the economics and possibilities because from Inessa, all would like to hear the kind of market that is ahead of you in terms of economy.
Thank you very much. Um, good morning and uh, happy Diwali and congratulations to Israel on launching OneWeb. Uh, very special times. Um, I agree with what's been said uh, so far. Um, IFC uh, on Aero, uh, Maritime, that's our market. Um, ATG is competing on Aero, but um, again, there's problems when you go international, even um, local, uh, even regional, you have to have um, uh, roaming agreements and it's very complicated. But satellites is ubiquitous. Um, we are going, we are dominating that market and we continue to do so. Um, it's, it's quite limited though. Um, you have a limited number of aircraft in the globe. I think there's about 8,000 not connected worldwide. Uh, in the maritime space, um, limited as well. You do have cruise ships, passenger vessels, and even if you look at fishing boats with narrowband communications, um, it's a big market, but it's limited as well. Um, but having said that, when you connect each and every vessel, each and every fishing boat, each and every um, airline, uh, business jet, it translates to big revenues, big connectivity numbers, and that's ours. So over time, not too worried about that vertical, there's competition within this panel to go after that. And it's going to be healthy, it's going to be beneficial for the industry and for passengers and for fishermen all across the value chain. Um, one thing that was talked about yesterday and that, that stayed in my mind is that the, um, the government wants satellite and the space industry in India to benefit the common man. And that it's a good segue to uh, what I think is going to be the most exciting part of mobility, which is land mobile. And here we're talking about the direct to handset um, prospect. So if we follow what Elon Musk is doing, um, very innovative, he's going after everything. So he's gone after business jets, he's gone after Carnival, and he's going after our handsets. Um, there's a partnership with T-Mobile in the States, in the US. Um, it was followed by an announcement by Apple and um, Global Star. So um, going back to IFC in Maritime, it, it's a niche proposition that we will thrive on. But when we go to Landmobile and direct to device, we are going mainstream. So there are billions of uh, smartphones around the globe. There are hundreds of telcos around the globe, and uh, there are billions of users to be, on, to be tapped. Now, it's not clear how that's going to play out. Whose spectrum are you going to use? Um, Dr. Roberti, I'm sure, has a lot to say about that. It's not as simple as it looks. But if you look at what India wants to do within not the next 10 years or five years, but um, being told that it's going to be in the next six months, um, the floodgates may not open completely, but developments regulatorily, if everybody agrees, it will usher in new growth, it will usher in innovation, it will usher in um, innovative business models. And India, as um, envisioned by the panels yesterday, I think I'm positive that it's going to be there. The implementation, of course, is tricky, um, but I think there's enough talent and there's enough um, impetus to do that. So in closing, um, I think yesterday in the panel that I moderated um, decoding the space economy, the conclusion of the group is that in order for India to take off, you have to do three things. One, Israel has to be um, an anchor client, a big uh, stimulus to the market. Number two, you have to leash the billionaires of your country, and I think they, they are unleashed. They will follow where the, um, the money is, so to speak. Um, and number three, um, look at the downstream. Uh, the focus has been upstream. But um, my competitor from, uh, from a Deloitte said, if you focus on the downstream and you bottom up that approach, the, the upstream will follow. And the question I asked, so with, what's the priority and which comes first? And everybody said, you have to do it at the same time today. So with that, I think with mobility, um, very good prospects for India. And uh, good luck to everyone. Thank you. for those lovely comments. Uh, may I now request uh, Mr. Harsh Verma, Vice President of Sales Asia, the CEO, to make his remarks. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, so firstly, I mean, I agree with all the panelists. I mean, mobility is a very unique segment uh, where satellite has an inherent right to win. Unlike 5G backhauling or land connectivity, where we are always competing with terrestrial networks, uh, the pandemic uh, was a huge dampener uh, for the growth momentum that we saw 
in the mobility market, both in IFC and in maritime, uh, cruise as well. Uh, but the sectors are now bouncing back. Um, I would like to share a little bit of global trends as we see it in SES and probably some uh, cues from NSR as well, and uh, how APAC and India regions will play a role. Uh, one thing to note is that the how the connectivity experience is improving at your homes and offices. Similar experience expectation is spilling into the mobility sectors as well, uh, with the younger crew on board and merchant vessels. Uh, connectivity is sought after now uh, by the younger crew, uh, and and this is driving the demand for satellite-based connectivity. So, uh, first we'll talk about IFC. Yes, it's been a turbulent uh, phase uh, in India, uh, and and uh, airlines will take some time to recover. But if you look at where India stands, uh, I mean, it flies 15 crore passengers annually. It's the fourth largest aviation market in that time. But if you look at the connectivity part, it ranks only 37th uh, in terms of aircraft that are connected. I mean, today, I think there's only uh, probably tens of aircraft that are connected, and again, with L-band uh, in massage services. Uh, IFC is still not, Wi-Fi services are still not activated, like Shivaji said. Uh, but there are 1,400 aircraft uh, that are there in the Indian uh, commercial airlines. That is a market that needs to be tapped, where about 200 aircraft are already on order in terms of the IFC equipment. Uh, globally, what NSR reports and forecasts say, um, today it's a 9,000 aircraft connected market. It will double in 10 years. Uh, but most importantly, it's not just the number of aircraft, it's the revenue and the capacity demand that will flow. Uh, today, it's a 64 Gbps global market. It will grow to one terabit. And the revenue, which is expected to grow, is 1.2 billion globally to 4 billion. And Asia will lead that. Uh, a lion's share will come from Asia because of the large population and large number of unconnected uh, aircraft. Um, I think one of the other thing that has been largely untapped or not even attacked in India is the business aviation jet. I think, I think this is where, um, this is a high ARPU market uh, where uh, we work, uh, SES works with Collins uh, Aerospace uh, to provide business uh, jet connectivity across the globe. And, and this is something that uh, should be looked at in India where the business case will be viable. Uh, now let's talk about um, uh, maritime. Again, maritime, um, uh, 35,000 uh, vessels are expected to be brought on board uh, with the connectivity. India has about 17,000 vessels, uh, I mean fisheries and others, which are not yet connected. Uh, data usage in the last two, three years, we have seen the merchant shipping, uh, the data usage has grown three times. Again, when, when I said it's mainly due to uh, crew welfare, uh, telemedicine, and, and really the digitized operations taking uh, uh, precedence uh, during the pandemic. Uh, again, capacity demand as per NSR is expected to grow tenfold. Uh, here I would say um, uh, all satellites, uh, it will be a multi-orbit play. Obviously I agree with Intelsat uh, that the softer defined satellites where you can stitch together connectivity, not on a really global level, but really look at the uh, right aviation routes and the cruise routes, if you cover that with your software defined satellites, that will play uh, 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 an important role. Uh, but we will see a decline in C-band connectivity, definitely. Uh, but K and KU-band HTS uh, will see prominent growth. Uh, and, and some of the growth will come from the NGSOs as well. Uh, SES um, today offers uh, a, a global platform, like Shivaji was saying, it's a global roaming platform. We work with multiple partners in, in, in all the countries to bring the roaming uh, uh, services to our uh, global customers. So we, we term this network as Scala, uh, much like Intelsat Flex. Uh, Scala is a Luxembourg word for scalable. And, and this network today uh, is operating a uh, number of vessels. And again, during the pandemic, we saw growth uh, twice in terms of data throughput and 50% and growth in terms of connected uh, vessels. Uh, this We work, uh, uh, again, it's a go-to market for us is not direct. We don't go to airlines. We don't go to shipping companies direct. Uh, we work through our service providers. 
and and we feel uh, similarly that uh, the only thing that uh, was a deviation was Merck's, where we signed a direct contract for global connectivity. Uh, cruise uh, segment is very, I, I would say India is a late bloomer to it. Uh, cruise has been a segment which has been very, very profitable for us, especially with the MIO services, uh, where we delivered uh, 500 to 600 megabits on a single vessel. Uh, you have to look at that these are 5,000 crew, uh, 5,000 passengers, 2,000 crew, 7,000 people stuck on a boat for a week or so. And, and the connectivity experience are being expected as good as your living room. Uh, the cruise companies are able to monetize, uh, I mean, this capacity uh, and, and, and of course improve the operational efficiencies uh, themselves. Royal Caribbean, Carnival are very large customers of us. I think India also has potential, I mean, with, with the jeweled islands of Lakshadweep and Andaman, where cruise uh, routes could be developed. Um, lastly, which I think I'll um, touch upon is Aero ISR. Uh, this is a vertical which is, in SES, we look at it at, as a very focused vertical. And we're seeing uh, immense growth in this segment uh, because of the UAVs and drones. And, and we're working with US defense as well as some of the European nations where we have demonstrated uh, multi-megabit capacity. And it's also, you have to look at drone transmitting uh, multi-megabits, not receiving because you'll be, uh, we're able to demonstrate high definition video live streaming from a drone uh, to the base station. Uh, I think this is where I think we will see satellite connectivity demand in India. Uh, I heard, I read somewhere 5,000 UAVs will be inducted into the armed forces in the next 10 years. In India, this is where uh, satellite connectivity demand uh, will come from. Lastly, on uh, direct-to-device, uh, again, very, very exciting development. Uh, uh, Jose talked about uh, Starlink and uh, T-Mobile, Apple and Global Star. Everyone is talking about it. Um, I think it, it, it is an exciting technology because it helps operators expand the edge of their networks without any real investment needed on the ground infrastructure. But we'll have to see what kind of capabilities it can deliver. And really, I mean, the biggest issue is the regulatory uh, uh, part. So again, I mean, I'll just wrap up saying that IFM, IFMC reforms in 2019 have been great for the industry. Uh, Hughes, uh, Nelco, I mean, it's a, India is a large nation, but surprisingly only few uh, service providers. And, and I think it will really help them uh, grow profitably into the future. Uh, and SES has been part of this journey with Hughes, Nelco in partnership with ISRO. Uh, in, the, in, in the last 20 years, and I think in the next journey, uh, we are uh, creating that entity in India with uh, a partnership with the Reliance Geo. Thank you. For that, a uh, lot of statistics as it relates to India. Uh, now, since we missed having Mr. Brajendra, is there anyone from Nelco who would like to make a one minute kind of comment? Any of his colleagues? Okay. If not, for one minute, I will go back. Uh, Dr. Sheryl Ismail. Yeah, we will close. We started only at 11.05. Uh, half a minute. Do you like to make one remark or shall I request Mr. Rayappa to tell us uh, at least what is ISRO's thinking on uh, uh, various uh, legislation or policies related to mobility? Then we will take uh, just uh, two, three questions or views, at least very brief views from the audience. Because, uh, personally, I am not ready to miss hearing from the distinguished panelists we have here. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, already the panel has brought out the uh, relevant issues in this mobility segment. The one uh, highlighting thing is the still in the uh, uh, aviation side, the potential is not fully explored. Uh, we are also observing on that. But when it comes to satellite capacity, already uh, the, uh, the ISRO satellite uh, capacity is being used by NELCO for uh, aero IFMC services. Of course, we have enabled uh, the other players through Inmarsat and Intelsat uh, for catering to this segment. 
and as me, uh, even uh, earlier, uh, as Mr. Shivaji was bringing out, there were three to four hurdles. One was the regulations, the second one was the, uh, the price points and all those things. I think now the things are changing. All regulatory hurdles are cleared. DOT has enabled uh, not only IFMC, even land mobility also now it is possible. Second one, the antenna thing was a challenge. Now the new technological advancements is enabling the antenna requirements for mobility, thanks to, again, Leo's, the flat panel antennas and their capabilities going to add to this. Uh, again, from the capacity perspective, of course, there's going to be a, a, a lot more demand that uh, the new space policy will enable, it will not distinguish between any services, it's only looked at as a capacity. There will be a lot of scope for uh, players to come and add the capacity. Uh, of course, in terms of utility, there will be a lot more opportunities for uh, utilization. These are my thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I think I got uh, repeated warnings, but still, if there is any brief question or a comment of, say, 30 seconds each, two, three, if you are specifically asking to, pointing the question to someone, you can point, but probably at the cost of all of us, I will request you to discuss with them separately outside. Are there any brief questions? Yeah, please, please, there. Then we come out. Kindly be brief and, and also tell to whom you are asking the question. Thank you, and uh, thank you for the great panel. Um, the, 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 the major focus should be the end user, uh, who uses actually mobility to provide services. And it's not just uh, national ships or airplanes, it's actually foreign ships and foreign airplanes which operate under international treaties, you know, ICAO, IMO, and so forth. But also the passengers which are on the planes or, or on the ships as well, uh, they, in a way, don't care, let's say, the passengers, how they get the service, but they want to get a service, basically. They want to be connected, uh, including even the, uh, the ship owners and, and, and the airlines themselves, basically. Uh, I know there is an emphasis on uh, the operators, the antennas, or the frequency and the spectrum, but these passengers or these users don't see that, basically. So whenever, I think my, my, my suggestion would be that whenever the policies are actually uh, thought of, always think about the transport industry or the transport, uh, the DOT side of, 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 of the bargain and, 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 and the coin basically because they are the ones who need the connectivity uh, as, as bad and as much as uh, anybody else. So the policy should actually look at the users as well, not just the individual satellite operators for example. Thank you. Thank you. I think indeed that's the concern me, not able to take further questions. Now, any of the panelists, if they want to make as an afterthought or anything you think you've missed within the given time, maybe half a minute each, shall I request? With that, we will close. If you have anything to add, no? <laughs> they are all kind to the organizers and honoring the time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think it couldn't have been, the session couldn't have been better or more information filled within the time constraints. Indeed, uh, thanks everybody on behalf of the organizers and my own personal behalf. Thank you so much. It was quite an interesting session. I would like to thank our chairperson and following speakers for active participation and their inputs in the session.